one's coming to save you, ever. Not the second coming of Jesus, not your boss, not your wife, not your brother, not your sister, not your friends. It's you, that's it. And that's what you have to get comfortable with. You put yourself in the position to gain the opportunities that you deliver to yourself. Opportunities find those who are looking for them. If you're open-minded and you're receptive energetically to that, they will be afforded to you. And if you take them, you'll be rewarded. It's actually, why the fuck would I believe you don't believe you. My most powerful marketing tool is that I walk the fucking walk. That's it. The biggest reason people buy my shit is because I have done it. And it's immediately provable. When I started the sport of jiu-jitsu, it seems on the surface level that it's only been three and a half years, but it's 17 years of competing in rugby league. It's been 13 years of gym, like literally twice a day and every day. Whether you like it or not, what you've gone through is what you've gone through. You can't change it. There is nothing to be done about what you've gone through. It's only how you respond to it that makes it you make you know who you are. You decide who you are. Every single day, you decide who you are. You must learn to trust your word. The only way to trust your word is don't do anything that you haven't said you were going to do and vice versa. All right, we've got another really uh, fucking episode I've been excited about. It's not a business one today. This one, you, you look at this guy on the surface, he's become the number one guy in jiu-jitsu in Australia. So you'd think big heavyweight, bulky guy, full of tats, jiu-jitsu practitioner, you think maybe he's a little bit of a, uh, well, words I've thrown around doing some research, you'd think maybe a little bit of a meathead, or he, he, but this guy is extremely deep, thinker, spiritual. We're going to talk, talk about that whole fucking process you've gone over the last three and a half years. We're going to dive into the whole mindset piece. A lot of people calling you the mindset king um, and your thoughts and your process with discipline and everything you've been able to build in your life really fascinates me. But for those who don't know, you've gone from white belt to brown belt in less than two years. So 23 months, which for people in that space is, is unheard for. Um, a lot of people calling you the Aussie Gordon Ryan, which I guess is a compliment, but when someone's like a real competitor of you, I'm not sure how, how that sits with you, but from the outside looking in, that's obviously a compliment to be, to be compared to arguably the greatest jujitsu practitioner ever. Um, at this point now, thanks for coming, bro. We'll, we'll talk about a bunch of things, but first of all, just welcome to the podcast. Thanks for giving us your time. Yeah, I appreciate it. I appreciate the invite. I don't know where these, uh, these nicknames of all these people are coming Mate, from, but, um, if uh, they're on the internet, the, sure, that it, must be true. That's what I was, you're, you're a little bit of a controversial character. I was asking you why, and I think just a lot of your, your fast rise, you know, rubs some people up the wrong way and yeah. holds a mirror up to some people that maybe haven't lived to their potential and, they know they've been taking the easy way out and that can be a trigger for some people. So if someone's success triggers you, it's probably time to go into it and look at why that's the case. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll get into all that. The place I want to start with you, just because look, we don't always start here with every guest we have on, but I think for you definitely, like there would have been times to your childhood and adolescence that there were some pivotal moments that made you and started shaping you as, as the man you are today to be able to have this such crazy growth and success in terms of physical achievements, but also mental and spiritual developments as well. Going back to your childhood, I've got a couple of notes here as well, but what would you say some of the pivotal parts or some of the stories or moments from like your childhood or adolescence, late teens that started to shape you and push you on the, the direction that you're on now? Yeah, it's a good question. I think um, one of the ones that sticks out the most uh, for me spe specifically in the way that I've driven myself so so diligently in towards one direction and, and made big changes and recognized that it's it's not really up to anybody else to help you along. It's it's directly up to you. When I was a kid, I was really shy and I wasn't really well spoken and I was not having a bit of a stutter or anything, but I would always I would always have this angst towards conversation and social ability. And this was compounded by the fact that I had a safe place at school to go and run to. My mum was a canteen owner, so I always had a a, basically a trove that I could go and exist in and not have to have social consequences, being a little bit weird, being a little bit quiet, a little bit shy and everything else. And that lended to some, some pretty uh, less than optimal outcomes in terms of uh, being bullied and picked on, like you don't hang out with us at lunch and recess and all that sort of stuff. And I ended up finally securing a friend and we used to go to each other's houses and all that sort of stuff. And eventually uh, what ended up happening was this other kid was jealous that I was in the picture now because I was a little bit weird, a little bit reserved and he ended up, basically sequestering a, uh, a divide between the friend and I. And I was really left alone. And I was like, this fucking sucks. This is like, I'm eight years old and I have no friends. This is bullshit. There's, something's got to change here. And ended up moving schools and going to another school where I became immediately way more popular because I was the rugby league kid and all that sort of stuff. And even at such a young age, I started to realize how fickle all of those labels and stuff are. And that if you just define yourself by the outside and the extrinsic, then you're always going to be at the whims and the mercy of other people. So. I kept with the I, I kept with the process of 
diluting that message or, or dissolving that message throughout the entire time until I got to about 16, 17. And I went really hard on that where I just decided I'm going to march to the beat of my own drum no matter what. And there's not really much anybody can do about it. And if I experience more hardships and more difficulty as a result of that, it'll be worth it. Yeah. Rather than be someone that I am not and be praised for that, I would hate to be known as that person. So on these labels of social media and everything like that, controversial, whatever, <laughs> um, it does. It is true to to a certain degree. I will tell you what I think of you yeah. immediately, and I'm not <laughs> afraid to say it. And I don't think that that should be anybody's mode of of living. That's obviously my point of view, my perspective. People can do whatever they want. They're at to uh, the mercy of their their own decisions and the consequences of those things. But I just think that I never wanted to be somebody who was known as as a liar or anything like that. I always wanted to be authentic and courageous. We can go deep into that if you'd like to, but um, they're, they're basically the way that I govern my life now. That's something I can relate to a lot. And, and, and to that point, I think it's probably very much connected to it. You've spoken at length many times before about having a problem with authority or people that don't quite reserve, deserve the authority. I, I've, I was a pretty good in school. Like I got good marks um, and I wasn't a dickhead, but, you know, I was a little bit cocky because I was, you know, smart and good at sport and all that sort of stuff. And I would have great relationships with most of my teachers, but there would be a few and I was a good kid that, treated me in ways that I didn't feel was fair and, and, and executed their authority in ways that other teachers wouldn't. And I knew even back then as a, as a kid that was bullshit and they're, you know, taking their power to their head and letting it, you know, and using that to, you know, imp- take, take control over, um, over me because I probably triggered them as this smart kid that was doing all these things for you. And that, you know, that clash with authority, where do you think that comes from? You, you, you're very obviously drilled down to your, to your values and you won't compromise on that. But that problem with authority and particularly the people that you don't respect putting that authority onto you, where does that come from? And from an old man, and I was talking to my missus about this yesterday. It was kind of funny. He would always blow his top over the just most nonsensical things <laughs> ever. Uh, when we're having dinner at the, at the dinner table, like if your elbows got seen on the table like this, he would like punch them off yeah. so that it would be off. You had to like do it all properly. He came from a British, British background. So they're all prim and proper high tea, all that sort of stuff. So his parents obviously inflected a lot of that stuff on him. And it was just silly things like that. And I'm like, man, what the fuck's going on here? What are we doing? Like, does it really matter? I'm five years old. Does it really matter if my <laughs> elbows are on the table or not? Just let me eat my fucking peas and fuck off. And I just started to get this disdain. Me and him clashed heads a lot because it was just, you know, why just because you say so? It was always the, I wanted to know more as a, and he never gave me any good reasons. And we have a much better relationship now, obviously, because we reconciled a lot of that stuff. And, you know, you're younger and he, I was the first child and he's sort of figuring out how to be a parent. And I was a little shit sometimes. I told him to fuck off once or shut up once and he chased me up the stairs and threw me on the bed and gave me a hiding. And we didn't have a great relationship because I always thought he was on my case. Yeah. And this is the kind of thing is like, well, if you were being a good leader, then I would probably respect your word a little bit more. And then that just wasn't there. So although he was around for the first 11 to 12 years, most of the time, there was a lot of inconsistencies and he was always fighting with mom and they were always bitching and whinging and fucking complaining and all this sort of stuff. And money was a huge issue, always a huge issue. And I looked at that and I'm like, why am I following this authority? Because I don't want to have this happen to me even at a very young age. And I remember I was 12 or 13 and mum always struggled with being overweight ever since she had the kids, used that as an excuse to just become fucking overweight. And I said to her, I pulled her aside. I was like, hey, I want to start eating healthier. I don't like this. I don't like this lasagna, baked dinner, fucking bullshit, pull it out of the oven, whatever. Really took her aback. She's like, oh, really? And started to have the conversation. So she started to prepare healthier meals. And I thought that would kickstart a little bit for her. It didn't work, but at least it worked for me. Yeah. And not too long after that, I quit soft drink. I was like 12 or 13 year old. Because I'm like, I don't see any point in this. Why am I doing things that other people are doing or that other people are expecting of me just because it is? Why is that the case? And I'm sure you relate to this a lot with uh, entrepreneurial endeavors. You're like, why the fuck am I going to get a job and work for some other dickhead just because everyone says that I should? Can't compute it. Yeah, exactly right. And I really didn't understand that. And that obviously lent its way into school. It was like, well, you're a teacher. Okay. So you have some level of authority because you went to you came here and everything else, but you have nothing I want. You don't have a phenomenal body. You don't rock up in a fucking Lambo. Like, I'm sorry, Mazda 2 just doesn't cut it for me. <laughs> And you don't have any of the things I want. You don't work for yourself. Your time is rented by the fact that you have to show up here. You have to work shit hours, deal with shit kids all day. And you chose this, whether you like it or not. This is the 
consequences of your own respons- responsibilities that you've chosen to place time into different buckets and gather skills. And this is where you're at. And I don't really feel like listening to you because you don't have what I want. So fuck off. Yeah. And then that was perpetuated through my troubles with, I'm sure you've um, heard for basic, based on these questions that I uh, lost my license for 52 months, was a complete fuckwit on the road. Actually, not too far away, <laughs> not too far away from here driving a South Sydney training. And that was the same thing. It was like, well, I have the physical skills to be able to drive a car. Why is some dickhead in a blue shirt telling me that I can't? Mm-hmm. And that was obviously a stupid, like, I think I'm invincible. I'm 18, 19 years old. I got a chip on my shoulder. There's nothing you can tell me. And then I even realized serendipitously the futility of my own uh, displeasement with authority, so much so that I was just being a contrarian for contrarian's sake. Yeah. And I was actually ruining myself based on my own authoritative stance. So then I took a stance against that. I'm like, I will not end up like a fucking shit keeper because I just have this disdain for any authority. And I changed my tact a little bit. I'm like, okay, if it's worth it and if they've proven themselves in a specific field, that's to be respected because they've done things that I haven't done, which means they know things I don't know. Mm -hmm. And if I start treating people like that, I will actually become smarter as a result of that. So by getting conversations with people that have done things that I haven't, and I will gain value from their experiences that they've had that I don't have to then go through. Yep. And that's kind of where I generated this whole podcast idea. What I do now is that people can leverage off my experiences and my things that I've done so that they don't have to go through the same bullshit. They can still gain some valuable lessons on the back end. That realization that maybe you were rebelling just for the sake of rebelling, how did you, how did you reconcile that with yourself? Because being a bit of a dickhead in school when you don't really respect the teacher is one thing. There's no real consequences, but – Regardless, there's regardless of the the rules and the laws of society, whether you respect them or not, you're only going to damage yourself. But to say, oh, I can go 120 here if I want to. Yeah. Well, how did you reconcile those differences in yourself and just realize, hey, I can't have everything my own way if I want to live and exist in in the reality that we do. Uh, the threat of prison was pretty fucking <laughs> pretty, <laughs> do it. pretty good on that one. That was a big slap in the face. So I I ended up uh, I was driving suspended and then drunk at the same time and then I got thrown in the fishbowl when I got found up on uh, near Penny Hills Road on the M2. I was doing 120 in a 100 zone. They pulled me over, breath test, drunk. All right, fuck, see you later. Go and sit in the fishbowl for five hours and basically think of your life's decisions. And it was on that day on the 19th of May uh, that I ended up quitting alcohol forever. Um, I've had a couple instances between then when I turned 21 and a couple times when I came back from Canberra and, and whatever else. But for the gross majority of the last eight or so years, haven't touched it. And I was like, all right, that's a step in the right direction because I see where this is going. I could, you've got an innate ability to be able to see 10 years in, the, in advance and just extrapolate all of the habits and the stuff that I'm doing and think, how am I going to be when I'm 10 years older if I just continue down this path? And you have a directional bias based on that and you look at that, you future cast it, you go, do I want to be the guy that's still drinking 10 years past this with the same problem? Absolutely fucking not. I don't want to live the same six months ever. Ever, not once. If my same, if my six months is the same as the last six months, I'm not growing. And if you're not growing, you're dying. And I refuse to die early. It's never going to happen. Go on, go. On. So uh, when I when I got to that stage, I was like, all right, well, I've got to make a difference. And I decided to quit drinking. That was a massive step in the right direction. But the authority thing was still there. So I continued as 19 year old idiots do to do the wrong thing. So then I ended up getting uh, disqualified. And two years, and then I had five years on top of that from the RMS. So I'm seven years off the road. What motivation do I have to wait those seven years? I've got shit to do. I've got things to do, people to see, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's too much. And this is why they revoked, they redacted that, um, that law. It's called a habitual traffic offenders. And it's five years added by the RMS if you just keep getting fined, getting dumb shit. I got two of them eventually. So I was 12 years off the road, hanging over my head. And they realized that it sucks because there's no motivation to do the correct thing. Mm. I went to do community service with a guy. He had 36 years as a suspension. You're just going to drive. Yeah. He'd already been to jail once. What are you going to fucking slap him with again that he can't already handle? So he's just going to go and do it. So they redacted that and now they no longer do them. And it was at that stage where I got caught in Redfern driving from the Central Coast on a disqualified license. And at the time I was living in the Central Coast. And the guy said to me, he goes, if you got caught, in Wyong, near where you're living, there are more people in jail for traffic offences than there are any other crime by a factor of two or three. He goes, if you got caught there today, you'd be going away. They're going to throw you away, yeah. And I was like, fuck me. I was like, you just because of the convenience of driving the train instead of getting the train because it's a little bit easier. 
like short-term gain, long-term pain. Like I'm never doing this ever again. And since that moment really like really started to click onto that whole inverse is like, okay, short-term pain for a little bit, but long-term massive rewards. And you'll always get outside outsized rewards if you're willing to do things longer than anybody else that they're not willing to do. So what does that look like? So then I restructured my entire day. This is not necessarily like a conscious endeavor, but this is the flow on effect and the trickle down of all the results of going through those things. And now the way that I operate is I won't do anything for short-term gain. I don't give a fuck. I'm willing to wait the long game. I'm willing to wait 10 to 15 years. I, I don't care. And to go back to what you were talking about before, I, I think that one, of the major, one of the major reasons I've been so fast at succeeding in my sport is because I never wanted it to be like that. I never said I'm going to get a belt in 18 months. I never gave a fuck. I was doing it because I was interested in it and I was willing to wait 20 years to get what I wanted. And that just turbocharges everything. So that ability to see 10 years into the future and, and, and realize, hey, if I live my life with these sorts of habits and routines and practices, it's going to be this way. If I stay the same, it's going to be this. Or if I go down this path, it's going to be that. At what point in life do you realize you have this skill, this vision, and then start putting that to use? Is that after those kind of dramas, late teens, early 20s, where you're getting in trouble in the law, getting into fights, people coming, bottling you, that scar on your head, all that sort of drama? Was it after that? Because you also had these really deep thoughts about like getting off soft drink when you're a 12 year old kid. Like what sort of kid is thinking like that? Unless he has a parent, which doesn't seem was the case influencing you to the, to, to that positive direction. Yeah. It's not a unique thing to me whatsoever. Everybody listening to this has this ability. If you keep marching in a certain direction, it is unreasonable to think that you will end up in a destination that follows that path. If I walk West from here, it doesn't matter how long it's going to take me. I will end up in Perth. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter how many broken legs I have. doesn't matter how many snake bites I get, how much dehydration I have. If I continue to march that direction, I will end up there. So pick a destination, pick a goal, and pick an ideal life. Do you want to be overweight? No. Okay, well then fucking KFC and Mac is uninvolved. You could future cast that 10 years in advance and think, all right, well, if I do continue to eat KFC and Mac, what am I going to look like in 10 years? Bad as fuck and metabolically dysfunctional. That's just the way that it is. And if you have aspirations for driving Aston Martins and living in mansions, well, then working for someone is also not in that 10-year plan. Fuck, I've got to really start to hunker down here and think about what a business looks like. What, what skills do I have that I can give to the world? What problems do I have that I could solve? And then deliver that to people in the same aspect. And then how do I orientate my life to, to make sure that I'm only focused on those key things? So that when I started the sport of jiu-jitsu, it's – it seems on the surface level that it's only been three and a half years, but it's been 17 years of competing in rugby league. It's been 13 years of living in the gym, like literally twice a day, every day. It's been 13 years of studying the mind and listening to motivational speakers and all those bits and pieces. It's been 13 years of reading, uh, sorry, not 13 years. The first book I ever read cover to cover was 21. Since then, I've read over 500. Wow. And it's just, I was like, I need to learn from people that are smarter than me. And that's because I didn't have them in my environment. I literally didn't have the ability to ring somebody now and go, hey, what do you think about this problem? I didn't have that. So I had to augment that on paper or augment that on audiobooks or podcasts or anything like that because the 10-year journey in my head was like, I want to do the things that I want to do and I want to be successful at those things specifically. How do I do that? I need to find people that have done it before me so they can carve out some lessons that I don't have to go through and don't have to fuck up and don't have to experience. Not that you should avoid those things. Some things are unavoidable completely find that out in business is one of the best personal development tools you can ever have because shit will go wrong yeah. and you have to be able to react to it or respond to it, not react to it. And that's pretty much the way that I govern everything. It's just response. Like, what can I do about this? What can I do about this? And then you superimpose that on the directional bias of, well, I want to be here in 10 years. How do I reverse engineer that? Mm -hmm. Does it involve these things? No. Okay. Remove that. And for everybody listening, we have a negative bias. We tend to look towards a negative bias. So if you can figure out, what are the things that I absolutely am guaranteed that if I do, I will not get what I want? Let's go deep. Heroin is one of them. It's an easy one. It's a pretty fucking obvious one. You don't really need to articulate that. But spending eight hours a day on Netflix is also not one of those. Eating copious amounts of dog shit food is also not one of those. Being a terrible person to the people around you is also not one of those. Prioritizing short-term gain, long-term pain also not one of those. So you start to develop these heuristics that you can think of and then you go, okay, those are the things I'm definitely not going to do. Then you're like, fuck, how do I figure out the things I am going to do? 
flip it. It's just the opposite. So if heroin is not one of those things, you put that in that basket and you leave it alone. If eating dog shit food is not one of those things, you put that in that basket and leave it alone. You know what to do. Every single person listening to this knows what to do. The, the secret, the secret pill that everybody wants to know, that the secret is in the work you're avoiding. Everybody knows what it is. You're just not willing to do it. For whatever reason, maybe you haven't had enough pain. And I sure was fed up with my fucking pain basket. Because I, as you noted, I went through a bunch of shit. And like everybody does. And I'm yet to go through a bunch of shit. Now where I stand, there's a mindset guy called Peter Crone. If you've heard of him, he's really good. He says, hindsight is always 2020 because you can look back on your past and think that was exactly what I needed to go through when I needed to go through it. You do a little bit of personal development. Mm -hmm. He goes, hindsight doesn't have to be hindsight. It can be future sight as well. So that whatever comes, whatever's on my table, whatever's on my plate, I don't know that. I say I can see things. I just have it, have it stacking and I'm looking at it, what that will get me. In. But I don't know what's around the corner. And I'm happy with that because if I did, it wouldn't be worth it. I wouldn't, wouldn't go through it because I've already been through it. But I know that if something awful is going to happen, well, then I needed it to happen so that I, only so that I could learn from it and maybe speak about it in a context like this so that other people can see that if you just keep trudging forwards, you can have directional bias. Well, a, you'll be okay. But B, you can succeed in spite of those things. They don't make you who you are. They don't impoverish you. They don't make sure that you only see the world a certain way as long as you see it the correct way. You're like, all right, well, I've been through some stuff, but how does that benefit me? Not how does that impinge me? And then the world's yours. So this belief that everything happens for a reason, and I believe the same, where did this come from? What was the realization or was it just innate within you to understand that? Just a quick one from me. If you've been listening to the podcast for a while, you'd know that after scaling Happy Skin Co. to over $10 million per year, I spent close to 18 months creating the Viral Brand Builder program with teachers someone with zero experience how to launch and scale their very own e-commerce brand. With over 100 training videos and direct access to me, including one-on-one -on -one calls, you'll be guided throughout the entire process. Now, we already have a bunch of incredible results from students that are making multiple five and six figures per month. So if you want to learn how to build a business that has the potential to completely change your life, then click the link in the description and book in an application call today. Spots are limited as you'll be speaking directly to me. So hopefully I'll chat to some of you soon, but until then, let's get back to the podcast. It's a skill. I think, I think every mindset is a skill. It's not something you innately have ordained onto you. Uh, Carol Dweck has a beautiful book it's called mindset and talks about fixed mindsets and growth mindsets and fixed mindsets are, uh, well, my genetics won't allow me to do that or my socioeconomic standard won't allow me to do that. My parents won't allow me to do that. My trauma won't allow me to do that. And the growth mindset is the person that has what I want has only gotten there through skill acquisition. They've learned things. They've become more. They have the, Jim Rohn has a beautiful saying. He goes, you can have more because you can become more. That's the secret. It's an intrinsic battle. Everything's mental. You can become more so you'll have more. And I think it's a skill. So I think taking things that you go through, like when I was 19, I did not think like this. I thought the world was a horrible place. I thought I was very victim-minded um, because my mother, who I've spent the most time with in terms of parental guidance, is extremely victim-minded. Everything is somebody else's fault, including that of which people are successful. So when I used to ask her when we were in the car, we're driving in a Kia Carnival, it's a shit car. They bought it brand new. They were proud of it, whatever else. I like nice shit. Not Kia Carnival. So I asked her, I said, hey, how come that guy's driving a Porsche and how come we're driving a Kia? We always talk about wanting a Porsche. We don't have one. Oh, that guy's lucky. That guy's a drug dealer. That guy's more fortunate. His parents paid for it. So I grew up with that mindset and I got angry at the world because I didn't have those things. I didn't have those fucking skills. I just got dealt with a shit hand. And when you do a little bit of reading, you do a little personal development, you realize this has nothing to do with the hand that you get played, uh, nothing to do with the hand you get dealt, but how you play it. Some poker players, I don't watch a lot of it, but I obviously understand it. Some poker players have the shittest hand, but they play it so beautifully, so excellently. They fucking get everybody at the table to believe that they are holding a huge bag. They're not. And then they put their cards down. They have absolutely nothing, but they tricked you the entire time. So I'm like, fuck. Why don't I just do that? Why don't I just figure out a way to leverage this experience as something that's beneficial rather, rather than something that, something that isn't? Because whether you like it or not, what you've gone through is what you've gone through. You can't change it. There is nothing to be done about what you've gone through. It's only how you respond to it that makes a big difference. On, on the mindset piece, you said everything mindset, you, you have the belief that everything mindset is, is a skill and can be learned in, 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 in that fact. Now, 
for me, what I've realized about anything mindset related, I feel like I can have like a gut feel or an intuition something's right. But this is like the, the contradicting thing. It's like you need to believe you can or believe you will believe you are before it actually happens for it to happen. Then once you start to get a little bit of the real life feedback, the real life results, the, the initial seed of belief that you had gets 10 X a hundred X because you've now, you had that belief, but now once you've been able to experience the benefits of a mindset shift or a new technique or whatever, then I feel like it gets grounded and, and can never be destroyed. But how do you get people? Cause I know you do a lot of mentoring and coaching as well to get people to get that initial belief that they already are, that they already can before it's happened. Because that's a lot of the things that I see for people, whether it be business, whether it be relationships, whatever, dating, whatever, how the way they see themselves, they can't make that initial jump. I'll tell them for me, I felt like it came pretty naturally and I'm still trying to unpack and think about where my, you know, innate self-belief and confidence come from. But how do you get people when people are struggling with picking up a new skill or whatever it may be, anything in life that you're mentoring someone on to get that initial bit of belief to know that they can do all these things before they actually have the evidence that they can? It's a great question. Um, belief is also a skill. So you work on it and it's not something you intrinsically have. You said it felt quite natural, but I imagine 10 years ago, you have a 10th of the belief that you have now. I'm the same. And you should never let that stop you from doing anything. So I have a, a saying that I used to use and it used to be like my slogan or my catchphrase, do what you say, say what you do. And it's very easy to orientate your life in a correct mechanism if you only do that. If I am not willing to do something, I will not say it. Point blank. Like you guys said, be here at one. I fucking rocked up at one. I even made the wrong turn and went down the wrong <laughs> way in the tunnel. And I was like, I'm still going to be there at one because I left early and I allocated to this. Yeah. If uh, I, I said, I'm going to add an extra session and I had, I do it. I don't, I don't say anything outside of that. So for people that want to get to this stage where they can do it with higher order tasks, because I wasn't always like this, but if you want to do it with higher order tasks, you have to nail the 1% as the tiny infinitesimally small things you don't think matter. So if people want to instill belief in themselves, you must learn to trust your word. The only way to trust your word is don't do anything that you haven't said you were going to do and vice versa. It's if you do what you say and you say what you do, you build trust in yourself and there's ultimate, ultimate compounding uh, efforts on your belief that happens. So if people want a really foolproof way to do this, say you're going to wake up at a certain time and wake up at that time. Say you're going to eat breakfast in the morning and eat fucking breakfast. Say you're going to have lunch at a certain time, have lunch. Say you're going to have dinner and then have that dinner at the same time. And then say you're going to go to bed and go to bed at that time. And people think, what the fuck are you even talking about? You've just proven to yourself that you can be successful. Mm, that's massive. Because you are. Because you said you were going to do it and then you followed through. That doesn't seem like much. Do that for six months. Then say, I'm going to start a business. Then do it. You know what? I've, I've asked that question to many people. No one's given me such a clear answer like that. And the fact that when you don't do that, it's a subconscious cut to your self-belief. And whether you're aware of it or not, you're doing damage to yourself by not doing what you said you would do. And then if you can't even do what you say will you do, how are you going to do things that you can't even imagine yourself doing right now? If you can't even do something as easy as showing up on time, waking up, training, not eating all this shit, right? So go to the authority thing. Why the fuck would I believe you if you don't believe you? My most powerful marketing tool is that I walk the fucking walk. That's it. The, the biggest reason people buy my shit is because I have done it. Mm. And it's it, it immediately provable. You can Google me. And I walk the walk and I talk the talk and I haven't said things that I haven't done yet. And I don't like, I don't, I'm not too outlandish on it or anything like that. I love having jokes on the, on the platform of like social media and everything like that. But I really genuinely do hold myself accountable. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to fucking do it. Mm. And that way, when you know that I tell you good job, you know that it means it. That's it. I, I really want to understand you. You're a very unique individual. And I'm sure you've heard that a lot. And like, as I said, like pe people throw around terms like mindset king and, all, and all, the, all these funny things, which are funny to see on the internet. But really, you're a very deep thinker and unique. I want to try and unpack it and understand it the best I can. You mentioned you, your, your, your father and your mother, you know, were having dramas when you were young and you became the, 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 the man of the house at 12 years old. Do you think being the man of the house at such a young age has been a part of the process of you becoming this person? And how do you think that, that affected you to grow up so quickly at such a young age? No one's coming to save you ever. Not the second coming of Jesus, not your boss, not your wife, not your brother, not your sister, not your friends. It's you. That's it. And that's what you have to get comfortable with because 
inevitably you're the only one that's going to live all the experiences in your life. And it's always going to be you. People are going to come and go. People are going to die. People are going to enter your life. You might get nieces, nephews, cousins, whatever else. But you're the only person that's going to experience every single moment of your life. And the faster you can reconcile that, the faster you stop waiting for a handout, the faster you stop waiting for somebody else. And I had all these moments. I had all these moments when I was 13, 14, 15, 16. I had to fucking move out of home and work on my own and do all these things. And being a, being a role model for my brother and sister and uh, being a, a pseudo parent when I shouldn't have been and all that sort of stuff. And you start to think about the shoulds, the coulds, the woulds. And that destroys you mentally because you're like, what if I did do that? What if I did do this? What if I should have done this better? If anybody can learn something from this, I'm sure they already have, but would, should, and could should be removed, removed from your vocabulary immediately because there's nothing you can do about what you should have done because your past is your past. There's nothing you can do about it. So as soon as I started to think about it like that, I started to free up a lot of my energy and a lot of my time for now. And I wasn't worried about what past failures existed. I wasn't worried about what was coming around the corner. I just really had to take it day by day. And I've consistently brought myself back to that because once you get too carried away with what could happen with this, or especially when you start a career or you start a business or one of the biggest things we always come up against um, in, in my program specifically, but also with the gym is I'm going to be the next UFC champion. No, you're fucking not, buddy. <laughs> no, you're not. And we're not trying to fuck with you. We really yeah. aren't. But someone coming in who's never taken a lesson before, you don't even know what that means. You have no idea what that means. Give me two years of training under your belt and then tell me, then I'll believe you. You've not even stepped foot on the mats yet. How the fuck would you even know what that means? And, and people try and get carried away. And the inverse of that, well, I could never be a champion because of this failure, this failure, this failure, this failure, this failure. And, and you sit there and you look at that and people are completely dominated by what's in between their ears and what they've experienced. And really, there's a, like Nietzsche was right, there's a nihilistic property to everything. And you can think, well, if I can't change anything that's happened to me, what the fuck's the point in trying? Or you use the positive inflection of nihilism and you go, nothing can change about my past. So why the fuck do I give it any time of day? Oh, that's right. I don't. I just live here now. And I know it sounds trite and controversial and everything like that. And everybody's like, oh, you're fucking hippie yoga, whatever. I don't get over it. I like living my life. If it works for you. It works for you. Great. I hope it does. If it doesn't work for you, stop fucking listening to me then. Yeah. It doesn't make a difference to me. I'm going to keep marching on the beat of my own drum no matter what you say. So on, on that point of like some random bloke walking in day one saying I'm going to be the next UFC champion and all that now, I understand how ridiculous that is, but what you've achieved, and I don't know what was in your head before you stepped onto the map for the first time, are you thinking I'm going to be, you know, Australian champion ranked number one within a few years or you didn't have those sorts of expectations put in yourself at that stage? not cross my mind once. Serendipitous. We're in COVID, we're in lockdown number two, uh, not lockdown number one in 2020. So the back end of 2019, I believe it started in like January. We're about yeah. to come out or something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My, mate, my best mate Zach says to me, he goes, do you want to do some karate in the garage? And I'm like, okay, I like Step Brothers, let's do it. <laughs> and uh, I went down there and uh, two of my other really good mates, Connor and James were there. And we rolled out the mats. We started doing this weird gay shit called jujitsu. And uh, jumped in, had a crack, uh, and was just willing to take the opportunity head on. And I put them all in inside control. And if people don't know what jujitsu is, it's just me laying perpendicular on top of them. Mm -hmm. Squeeze the life out of them, and they couldn't do anything about it. I was bigger, stronger, faster, more athletic. Had they done any training in the in the past? Those guys in they'd it? done six months or three months respectively, but yeah, it yeah. was a varying degree. I think Connor had even done maybe like eight months or whatever it was. And they go, "You should do this," <laughs> and I'm like, "Okay," and. Again, serendipitously, I mean, you, you put yourself in the position to gain the opportunities that you deliver to yourself. Uh, opportunities find those who are looking for them. And if you're open-minded and you're receptive energetically to that, they will be afforded to you. And if you take them, you'll be rewarded savagely. I'd like to put some context into the story of me starting jiu-jitsu, I'd had two years off of any sport and a failed rugby league career where I was going to be the NRL guy and I fucking wasn't. And I had this big identity shift and like, man, I not going to be the footy guy. Uh, since I was four, I wanted to do this. I have cried because my team didn't win the semifinals when I was eight or nine years old. That's how passionately I love the sport. And that ended up fading and dying and going away. And I'm like, what am I going to do now? So I literally have dedicated my entire life to how this. How old were you when you decided to move on from 
40. 21. 21, so young. Yeah. What made you make that decision? Injuries, mm-hmm. politics, bullshit, uh, kind of loss of love for the sport. I, di- I didn't, didn't see myself doing it for the next five years. Try and make it. Because you, 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 you played under twenties. Was it for South? And then uh-huh. you had like a training trial with the Raiders. And yeah, I w- Yeah, I was. I've achieved basically as far as you can go without playing an NRL game. What position were you, by the way? Uh, I started in the earlier when I started. I started in like second row, mm-hmm. and uh, I got a little bit faster, a little bit, more, a little bit more nimble. So I went to the centers, went back to the second row, and then back to prop as I started getting heavier and yeah. eating dumbbells for breakfast, lunch, and dinner <laughs> at high school. And, uh, yeah, so I had this lull. I had this period where I was just lifting weights. So what was your goal? Because you seem like such a goal-orientated person. Now you're fucking – you have this massive goal of becoming the, like, world champion in jiu-jitsu. That is a, such a big, powerful driving force for anyone, mm. but particularly for a person like you. What was guiding you? What was driving you? What was pushing you in those two years before you found – so like you said, serendipitously, what would be the rest of your life or at least the next big chapter of, of, of Josh? Well, for the first time ever, it was nothing. Wow. I didn't have anything. And I was just in this lull period of like two years of basically nothing. And um, I went through a couple of horrific injuries. My right ankle got completely destroyed and my left Liz Frank ligament in my foot, which is the thing responsible for keeping your arch, maintaining your arch in your foot. Uh, okay. Um, just went bang one day. And it was a year and a day after my previous injury. So it was August 13th to August 14th, 15 to 16. Uh, 2015, Because these franks take ages to recover from and they're not really straightforward as well. 12 weeks yeah. and it's very finicky and it's very touch and go. And the doctor said, you might never have like an arch in your foot again. And I was like, fuck you, I'm going to prove you wrong. That's mental. Um, so I went through the rehab of both of those and I was about to start playing again in second grade. And I'm like, fuck, I've come from 20s to grade now to like third division. Mm-hmm. And it was hard to stomach. And I was like, am I going to do this for the next five years? And I asked myself and I was like, nah. Mm-hmm. So I packed it in. and endeavored to start my personal training career and, and all that sort of stuff. And I wanted to start thinking about making money and all that sort of shit because unbeknownst to most people, rugby league gets paid <laughs> fuck all. Unless you're in the top couple percent. Unless you're in the top, top, top. Uh, even then you're, you're an employee, you get taxed at 50%. It's fucked. Yeah. Um, I mean, look, those guys aren't saying no to one and a half a year. Yeah. Um, but at the same time, there's, there's things that people don't know. And I just sat myself down. I was like, am I willing to go through another five years of this? And the answer was no. You just didn't care enough at that point to put yourself to that, right? I just, I didn't see myself doing it. And if I don't see myself doing it long-term, there's no point doing it for another day. A lot of people get stuck with like the sunk cost fallacy. I've given so much of my time or money into this thing. I must continue or it's all a waste. But it's a skill to know when to pivot and shift and to trust yourself and know where to go next. But I know a lot of athletes when they uh, retire, they stop playing, whether it be young, early in their, earlier in their adult career or, or later, they struggle with this whole identity crisis and go into a real battle with mental health. Did you have any, were you, were you head fucked for lack of a better word, or did you struggle with anything like that? Or like you said, you just thought, okay, let's work towards making a little bit of money and trying to like establish my independence in, in that, in that form. Yeah. I'm pretty fucking autistic. So whatever I do is like, I do it a million percent. Yeah. So I just moved to the next thing. Okay. And it's probably a superpower for most people if you could just find a way to move to the next thing and not dwell on the past too much. And I'd already developed a lot of the mindset stuff that we're, we're sort of speaking about now, not the way that I articulate it now, but if I look back on that period of time, I can say that I definitely thought some elements of this would be very useful and I started to apply them pretty, pretty religiously. And there was a couple of periods where I was like, oh, look, I, I wish I was still doing that. But the, again, I made that decision. So for me to wish that I was still doing it would be stupid because I made the decision to pack it in. So then I'd be fighting myself and I don't do that. So I was like, okay, well, you've decided to do this. Back yourself. And this goes all the way back. I'll give you this story. It's a cool story. Um, When I was nine, I was playing footy for a team that I was meant to be in first division. And the son of the coach was in the same position as me. And he goes, fuck you. I'm putting my son in. His son fucking (laughs) sucks. I cut him in half every training session. Anyway, so all of the guys who had the same response, uh, similar thing happened to them. The coach's son or the friend of the friend of the friend, they got put in the team instead. And they said, fuck this. We're going to a new club where we're going to go start our own thing because it was a brand new club being started. And I ended up moving there when I was in under 10s. But I stayed at the same club that I was at in under nines because and my dad tells me this all the time. He goes, I've got two really proud moments of you and this is one of them. And I asked you what you wanted to do. And all your friends left you. 
all of them, every single last one. I didn't know any kids in this new team and it was going to suck. The season was going to be shit. The team was fucking shit and we we're going to lose all the time and, you know, we just had a, didn't have a good team. I said, no, nah, I'm staying. I told these guys I would play for them and I'm going to play for them. That's it. And you look back on stories like that and it's cool when your parents remind you of stuff like that because you're like, no, nah, I was, I literally was the way that I am today when I was yeah. fucking nine. Like you said, if you say you're going to do something, you do it. Correct. And I think that's, it's worth so much. And I was talking to one of the boys about this yesterday and I said, I would always rather, like say if I had a half million dollar job offer, but I had to work for somebody else, I had to run to their drama, I had to dress the way they wanted me to dress, I had to say the things they wanted me to say, or I could earn 50 grand on my own. Mm. every fucking day I'm taking that because it's so important. It's so important for you to lead yourself and be accountable for those decisions and all those sort of things. But it's so important for you to be forced to follow up your actions or your words with your actions. Why do you think so many people run from accepting like full personal responsibility over all facets of their life? Oh, what a loaded question. Um, Cause you would see it a lot. I do. Highly competitive field. You're the top dog. You coach a lot of people. You would see people with elite mindsets that can take your advice and put shit together. And other people, for whatever reason, like you said, will have excuses or victim mentality as to why they can't because of X, Y, Z things that happen to them, their friend, their sister, their mum, their brother. Yeah, a lot of a lot of them haven't a lot of them haven't navigated to reconciling that their intrinsic world is everything. Their intrinsic world is the entire reason you're exactly where you're at right now. Nothing outside of you makes you who you are. It's how you respond to it. You and I can look at this lamp. We both agree that it's orange, but it is a different orange to me than it is to you. We will never be able to tell each other that because we have different rods and cones in our eyes and different genetics and we've been exposed to so many different things. But the fact of the matter is, is I can agree with you that it's orange, but it's only going to be personal to me. Let's use an example of a circumstance. We can both see the same horrific shit and you go, ha I think that's funny. And I think, fuck, that's horrible. What changed? Nothing. It was just our internal perspective of what happened. And this happens with your entire life. And the faster you, rec the faster you recognize this, the faster you become the captain of your own ship. Because anything can happen to me, but I'm going to internalize it and say, why did I choose to experience this? You know how powerful that is? It's fucking ridiculous. Something bad happens to me, like, God forbid I get into like a horrific car crash and I break my leg and I'm off the mats for two years. Why did I choose this? Not why did that stupid motherfucker drive drunk? Not about him. Who care less? Can't control, can't control his decisions. Why did I choose to experience this? Maybe I chose to experience this to have more resilience and more adversity and more mindset generation for the fact that I could stay disciplined for something I cannot physically do. I'm going to stay in the game mentally. I, my foot is hurt at the moment. I've laid on my back and played guard for the last five days straight. I, will, I refuse to stop training. And if I was physically incapable, like I'd break a knee or my spine gets fucked or something like that, I will still be attending all the sessions that I said I was going to attend. I'm not having time off. It's not happening. I've missed two sessions in my career. One, I went to go see Mark Normand. <laughs> because I deserve a night off. And my sister said to me, this is a birthday present. Yeah. My sister had this weird funky thing. She's like, we're not doing presents anymore. They're too expensive. And then she reneged on that a couple of years later. And the second one, I was moving houses and I rang my old coach to tell him, I was like, look, man, I'm moving houses. I've got a fucking whole truckload of shit here. I'm not going to be able to get it down before I train. Two sessions of the multiple, multiple thousands of hours that I've done. And... That, that just goes to show it's like you, you just decide it's, it's an intrinsic thing. Mm. It's an intrinsic mechanism. You're like, I'm going to fucking do this and I'm going to stick to it. And nothing outside of me is going to change that. One of, the, one of the biggest realizations or perspective shifts, whatever you want to call it, that changed my life was the realization that life is happening for me, not to me. It's so simple. And you can say it to someone and, and everyone can understand it logically, but when you actually get it and you realize, holy shit, when you embody it. Life is so different. And you know, I know you're a believer that there's no such thing as accidents, mistakes, coincidences. When you took on that mindset and approach, what, what, what feeling did that give to you? For me, it was freeing. Mm. I didn't have to stress about all the little things because the universe is a plan or God or whatever you want to call it. If you have trust in yourself and belief that you're meant here to do those sorts of things and the universe will take you there, then that's a freeing experience for me anyway. What was it for you? It was always I get to versus I have to. 
I get to versus I have to. Even yeah. the things that some people might look at as chores or the tougher side of discipline, like. Well, you know. Let's play it out a little bit, right? I train 15 times a week. Do I have to do that? You get to do that. I used to have this conversation with personal training clients and they said, well, I have to go to the gym three days a week. I said, listen, this is going to be a bit grandiose of an example. Am I at four o'clock in the morning coming to your house in a balaclava with a gun in your face, driving you to the gym? No. Okay. So you don't have to. It's a choice. That means you can or you can't. But what do you want? Do you want to be a fat slob or do you not? And they would reiterate to me that they, yes, in fact, did not want to be a fat slob. Okay. I'm telling you how to do it. But if you say I get to, think about it. I have to go pick up the kids or I get to see my children. Yeah. You can feel it when you say it. There's so much there's there's so much to be said about the unseen, like our five senses and all that sort of stuff. And people look at the world in a very specific way where they think that everything in front of them is all that they see and there's nothing ethereal and everything like that. And I'm sure that serves some people fine. Go whatever, do whatever you want. But for me, there's so much about the feeling of which you operate yourself in every single day. And just a little change of language is so important. I don't have to go to those sessions. I don't. I don't have to go to those sessions because I have big, hairy, audacious goals. I get to. I get to go to every session. And just a little sprinkling of that in your day. I was somebody who always struggled with gratitude because I wasn't very grateful for what I had. I really wasn't because I didn't have a lot. And so much so that I got uh, Rhonda Byrne's second book. I don't even know the title of it. Some gratitude fucking nonsense. And I was like, all right, well, you missed a skill set. Try and fucking build the <laughs> skill of gratitude. And I call myself on this shit all the time. Yeah. And if people, if people really understood how hard I am on myself, they would, they would understand the exact way that I am and why I am the way I am. So I did this 30-day gratitude thing. It's fucking nightmarish. I got to get the book and I got to reiterate it. Day number 14 is go and find a rock. It's going to be your gratitude rock and you pray to the gratitude rock and you just feel good while you're holding it. You close your eyes and fucking braid your pussy hair or whatever. <laughs> Go do yoga classes at Bondi. And uh, you sit there and you do it. And I felt so fucking stupid doing it. And that was all by design because I was meant to see the futility of it that I, if I could feel a little semblance, a little sprinkling of great gratefulness for sitting cross-legged holding a rock, then my life isn't that bad. Because I afford myself the opportunity to do such silly shit just for the uh, evidential skill acquisition of becoming more grateful. So now that I look at my life and I think, fuck, I get to do all this shit. Like, I'm sure there are people that are riding the bus right now in a sweaty suit that fucking hate what they're doing, thinking only underneath the terms of I have to. And you and I get to sit here and talk about fairies and whatever else. I, and this is a really interesting thing and I, I know you're big into energy and, and 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 all that stuff and that's where I kind of want to take this next but like on this so my partner's um she's from Brisbane originally she lived always her whole life in Queensland she moved down about two and a bit years ago and like we'll walk through some areas of Sydney um and like I just get these feelings in some of the places whether it's streets that I went down because before I started my own business for a while for about two years period I was doing sales so you know going to different meetings doing the shit and like definitely at that time whether I probably didn't realize it at the time because I always try and have a positive outlook because again you have two you have two choices do I take this in a positive way and you know get self-conscious and beat myself up or do I look at it and frame it in a positive way and always try and move forward so I didn't quite realize it at the time but I walked down these streets or past these buildings where I used to have these meetings and I get I just I'll be having a great day and I walk down it and I remember the energy and the state that I was in and I can't, mm. I just feel really weird because I almost like didn't realize how fucking unhappy I was doing that because I was trading, I was trading my life, my soul, my energy to this solar system that I fucking absolutely hate and intuitively have hated my entire life. But because similar to you, I grew up in, in, in a lower middle class family. I didn't know anyone that started businesses. Like the reason I went to uni, I, well, I lasted a few months in uni because me as the ambitious kid, that I was all from the people I had around me, the most ambitious you could be was go to uni and be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So I thought I wanted to do that. And that set me down all my path, but I walked past these places where I had meetings and regardless of the state I was in before then I go down these places and I just feel for whatever reason off. I feel like I did back then. And it puts me back into that state of like, I really didn't fucking like that. And that what you've iterated in a somewhat, less than positive or less than advantageous sense is the real key to the kingdom is that you can just think about where you were 
at that period of time and feel that gut-wrenching, disgusting emotion in your stomach, you're not the same person you used to be. No. And you also aren't able to time travel back unless you think about that exact scenario. And I can think about all the scenarios of like you mentioned before, and I got bottled in a house invasion. I remember the fear that was coursing through my veins and every single moment of that was in slow motion. And I can replay it in my head whenever I want. And that used to give me such angst and disgust until you reconcile it and go, no, I did exactly what I needed to do when I needed to do it. And now I do that in the opposite direction. I think about how fucking cool it's going to feel. I sit down, close my eyes, listen to some piano. How cool it's going to feel when I do all the things that I've said I'm going to do privately in the next 10 years. And then I live that emotionally with the charge of the energy that I'm feeling that you felt when you walked past this specific place that gave you the gut-wrenching sort of thing. You're doing that, not the place. It has nothing to do with the place. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. If you really tried right now and sat here and went, what did I feel like five years ago? And that shit fucking job and I fucking hate it. You could muster up the energetics of that easily. Think about it like this. This is a really easy example. Think about your favorite. What's your favorite food? Um, let's just say uh, bread. Like Any you, fucking like the bread. fucking focaccia softest, the hottest loaf of bread. You're the focaccia with the oil. You're yeah. like you can smell it, and you like your your mum or whatever has just cooked it out of the oven, and you're like wafting in like one of those Disney characters on the smell, and you're smelling it. You're like, oh, it's gonna yeah. taste so good. I'm salivating now yeah, dude. and I don't even like focaccia that much. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. So it's just language and how you operate. And then you can, you could physically be there as if you're about to take a bite of it. Where's the bread? It doesn't exist. I need to go back and re rewire that in, into like speaking of gratitude and be grateful for that experience as well, which I am because I wouldn't be here today without that experience, but something maybe because I haven't gone back and reconciled that and, and cleared my thoughts around that time in my life. I walked out and I will just be put in that weird state. Possibly, but it's also a good reminder that you're the one who's generating the state, not, yeah. not the place. And as soon as you recognize that, I had an ex missus and she wanted to move to uh, Newcastle. She had a weekend away there with her friends, loved it, got drunk, had heaps of fun. Yeah. And she goes, I want to experience more of that. And had falsely assumed that Newcastle was the reason that she felt like that. And looking back on it now, because we're exes, it might have been because she was away from me for a week. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm happy to say that. But I listened to a podcast with Peter Cronin and Aubrey Marcus, and Aubrey Marcus was questioned by Peter Cronin. He said, what is your favorite place on earth? And he goes, my house in Sedona. He goes, I fucking love my house in Sedona. And he goes, what would you do if that was taken off you? Oh, God, I'd be pretty bummed out. He goes, but could you go there mentally? And it's not the reason. So Sedona doesn't make you feel any type of way. Sure, lovely place, desert, arid, really quiet, no cell reception, really good communication, all that sort of stuff. You have heaps of parties there, everything. But you're the one who's bringing the experience to Sedona, not the other way around. You're the one who's bringing experience to life, not life to you. So when something negative happens to you, your choice. When something positive happens to you, your choice. If I have to lose the next 10 fights, I won't, mind you. If I have to lose the next 10 fights so that I can fucking grow mentally, I'll do it because I chose that experience because something up here or around here or wherever you want to say that it is has determined that that's what I need. And I have chosen that as a result because everything that's happened to me ever, I've chosen. And you can get really fucking dark with this if you'd like to. Like if your parents die, you fucking chose that because it was meant to foster something of growth within you. It's meant to be a fertile seed that, you weren't meant to see unless something tragic happened to you. You can go one of two ways. You know, the world's a horrible place. My parents died. I'm never going to amount to anything because I've got no support and I want to turn to nothing. Or you could go, why did I choose to experience this? Why am I one of the few people that have their parents die at a very young age? Peter Crone did the same thing. His mum died at seven. His dad died at 17. Oh, you're an orphan at 17. You have no idea how the world works. You're 17 and now you literally have no parental guidance whatsoever. And he's now a super successful mindset coach because he applied himself in the correct manner. Mm. If that guy can do it, why can't you overcome your high school thing where someone called you fat? But it's even like, because I feel like some people will struggle to go like and accept that I chose that. But all you need to do, right, and this is as far as it needs to get for me, is look on the flip side. What's the opposite way of thinking like that? Like mm. you said, life's fucked. Everything's bad happening to me. I'm just going to experience a life full of pain. Like, why would you choose that? Because you're going to manifest that into your life. 
life sucks. Everything's hard. I can't do this because of X, Y reason. Okay. Now what? Yeah. You're right. Now what? Exactly. Oh, oh, you mean that I have to be accountable for my decision? Yeah. People say this to me all the time. They're like, oh, I just don't feel like I can make it. And I'm a bit of a cunt about it. But I go, okay, you're right. You'll never be successful and none of it's your fault. Now what? And they just sit there. Their whole world breaks because they think think that you're going to back them. They think, why would I back you? You don't back you. Mm -hmm. Why are you waiting for my backing? You should be backing yourself. And the sheer fact that you don't, then then they'll do this weird contrarian thing because it's positive psychology. They'll go, no, I will do it. You're like, now you're playing the game. Congratulations. Welcome to level one. (laughs) And then they go off and they do things with it and they need somebody to just cut them where they're at and then just go, no, okay. Because you're exactly right. Play it out. What are the next 10 years of life going to look like if you blame every single other person except for you? What are they going to look like? You're going to get no results. Hang around the people who complain and bitch and whinge all the time. Where are they? Nowhere. Nowhere forever. Go back to them in 10 years. Go back to your high school reunion and see the people that have the personality traits that you don't want to espouse, that don't match success in any given endeavor. And I'm not talking you just have to fucking want Lamborghinis and Ferraris or whatever. If you want that, cool. I'm in that club. It doesn't have to be for you. That's exactly fine. Some people are completely happy just starting a family and doing that sort of thing. But if they're not, if they're whinging and bitching and complaining, I guarantee they don't have what they want. Even if they do, if they have a super high paying job, they're fucking miserable. Because they're thinking that the other guy that has the more super high paying job is better than them because they're always blaming their external reality, not their internal. And then you get to a stage where you don't blame anything. There's a, there's a really good, I'm going to try and paraphrase it. There's a Buddhist philosophy. It's like if you first blame everybody, you're lost. You start blaming yourself, you're a little bit closer. You blame no one, you've arrived. Got it. Yeah. I want to I wanna next talk about visualization and law of attraction because it kind of stems nicely on from what we're talking about. And this is something that if anyone knows or anyone listens to any of the podcasts I've been on as a guest has absolutely transformed my life in so many powerful ways. And, and the way I understand things is, is different to the way under, you understand things. And I think because of that fact, you'll be able to explain it and articulate it in a little bit better. The way I understand things is I feel it and I get it and I don't need any other evidence to say it's because of X, Y, Z, the energetics and all that sort of stuff. I've talked about my experience with it. I will, I know the power of the law of attraction and you, you mentioned before, okay, if we're talking about a, a goal or a moment that you're going to live in the future, living that in your head with all the emotions attached and experiencing that when you do that consciously and strategically, you fucking wait and you watch how fast life gets out of your way and you'll achieve those things. But talk to me just generally about your understanding and your belief and your experience and maybe your process living the law of attraction or whatever name, visualization, manifestation, someone wants to call it. I've actually done a lot of, uh, a lot, a lot of research into this. Uh, it's, it's been one of the perversions that I've had it's just, it has struck me out of the, the side of the head. And it's I'm, so addictive though, right? When you take the lid off this and that you see everything that's beneath yeah. it. Yeah. Like, and I've done a lot of research into the, uh, the theosophy of it specifically. And there's a, there's a moment in the Bible where Moses asks God, he goes, what's your name? And in the Aramaic and the Hebraic translation, it's a YHVH, but that translates to I am that I am, or I will become what I will become. Essentially, what you're saying that is that you can create. That's it. And depending on how deep into the esoterics you are, this was my personal belief. We're all fragmentations of the one that created everything. So thereby that means we can fucking create whatever we want. As soon as you get to that stage where you go, hmm, let me give it a crack. Let's see what can happen. Let, yeah. me, let me put some fingers in some pies and see what goes. And you realize that you really shit at it at the start. And the only reason you really shit at the start is because you've got a lot of clogging in the system that's, it's fucking it up a little bit. There's an argument you had last week. There's some childhood shit you went through that you don't have, you don't haven't reconciled that. And there's some things and negative energies and you hang around shit people and you're in a shit environment. And it's very difficult to do this sort of stuff until you clear that stuff away. So you go down this big fucking roller coaster of figuring out, well, I'm here for a reason. And the things that I've been through are happen for a reason. I don't have to resent them. I don't have to be angry about them. Don't have to have regrets. Don't have to say could, should, or would remove them from my cap- vocabulary. Then you start to get to level one where you're like, all right, well, I feel a bit neutral now. Let's, let's play some stuff on the other side. And you, you start to think about what would life be like if I did X, Y, Z? What would I feel? What would I taste? What would, it, what would life become if I could just knock this over? And, and for me specifically, when I was starting business, like 
what if I could just make my own money and not have to worry about anybody else or not have to worry about employers or anything like that? Let me just make a hundred bucks. That's it. Just let me sell something for a hundred dollars and then guarantee that I can fucking do it. What would that feel like? I'm like, I'd be pretty fucking excited actually, because I would have like cracked the code. And you go through that mentally a couple of times. And the way that I understand it, the way that I've developed this sort of thing, and you alluded to this perfectly is that there is no separation between a physical experience and a mental experience because it's all one. The, the first hermetic law of philosophy is that it's all mental. And the same with the focaccia example we just did. I could take you to a place where you think you're about to fucking eat it. So what's the difference? What's the difference between me thinking about what my life would look like if I did all the things I said I did? And then you sit there with your eyes closed. You're going to feel like a fucking idiot. And you go, what would it be like? What would it be like if I could buy anything I wanted with no restrictions? What would it be like if I had the perfect body? What would it be like if I have the perfect job? What would it be like if I found the perfect partner? How would my life transform? What would my day-to-day feel like? And then you start to feel this rush of emotion, of excitement, like a kid on Christmas. And that is the tickling of the strings of like string theory, and like the higher dimensions, of that being created. Because as soon as you charge it with energy, this is something I didn't do for a very long time. This is a huge key secret, is that I would think about what it would be like, and then I'd write the affirmations, and I'd fucking write the things in the mirror, and look at it, and read it, and write it a hundred times. But unless you charge it with what you would actually feel like if it was going to happen, it never happened. You can't blunt force your way through it. And the reason that it happens is that I am that I am. And if you experience it, that's it. It is therefore created. Not if you experience it in real life, whatever the fuck real life actually is. I don't determine third dimensional reality is real life anyway. So if you experience it, this is the same thing for negative psychology, right? When you have an addiction to a past life that when people have PTSD, this is the inverse. They have PTSD. They have a horrific event that happens. My partner suffers from this and we've done a lot of work on it. And she's um, been really, really good with the stuff that I've given her and little keys and tips and secrets. Every time you experience that event, a a huge tragic event, you will replay it in your mind because your body doesn't want you to experience it ever again because it's traumatic and it's, it's, it's terrible. Every single time you relive it, you're patterning your subconscious to remember exactly what it felt like, especially it's front loaded at the beginning. And you'll have a little bit of inkling of anxiety or terror or fear or anything like that. All those combined probably. And then when you relive it or you go to a certain place around the corner from where it happened, you get this like disgusting gut wrenching feeling. It's not happening again. It won't happen again. God willing. But you get to a stage where you keep reliving it energetically again and again and again and again. And you might never go through something that bad ever again but you are every day. That's why people who come back from Iraq or Afghanistan in the war, they hear a cash register go off. Like, because they think it's a bomb. They think it's a, a, a latching mechanism for a fucking landmine. They have to have their head on a swivel because they don't reconcile the fact that it's not going to happen again. They don't get to this stage where they seriously start to understand how important your energetics and your thoughts and your words and everything are. And everyone wants to say that manifesting is bullshit, but it's the only thing that exists. So get over it, get used to it. And if you continue down that path with that negative psychology, well, then the, the feeling and the emotion are still going to be there again and again and again. It's almost as if, as if it's real. Now, think that and nobody's going to argue with that. Nobody's going to disagree with it whatsoever. So why do you disagree with the other side? Yeah, the positive side. Exactly, of good things happening. Of when I first hit my first seven figures in sales or whatever, whatever business you're in or all that sort of stuff. Or when I marry the girl of my dreams or anything like that. Think about it like that. And then the exact same formula for the PTSD thing from the past and reconditioning your mind to believe it, do that, but future cast it. The big chunk thing is it has to be energetically charged. And if that is true, you have to be aware of what's zapping your energy because otherwise you won't have the fuel to create it. I started to turbocharge this when I stopped whinging, I stopped bitching, I stopped complaining, I stopped worrying about what other people said, I stopped worrying about what other people thought of me. Because I am that I am, not what you say that I am, not what you think I am. I am that I am. I decide. So why the fuck am I concerned with opinions of other people? It's adorable. People get on you and they comment on social media and they're like, mm, whatever. And you're like, I don't care. I don't. Good for you. I actually feel sad for you because you think that's appropriate way to live. But you just let it go and it falls off. It's just like water pouring, pouring over one of those uh, water feature stone things. It just slides off. So why do you think, and this is kind of going in a different direction, I don't want to sidetrack too far, but you mentioned like 
you look at like the mainstream science will recognize the PTSD example and they won't debate that. But then we talk about, you know, the law of attraction and they say, oh, it's bullshit. It's pseudoscience. Why do you think there's, why do you think they won't let people or they won't encourage people to go down that route? But for the negative, they're happy to realize and essentially justify it in the same principle, but they won't let it have the flip side. And it's pseudoscience. It doesn't exist. It's all. Because imagine trying to fucking control a bunch of cunts that didn't need anything from anyone. I don't need anything from anyone. I've got it all. Mm-hmm. I've got it all mentally. I don't need it. And everybody's going to think you're, fr- you're a quack, you're a this, you're a that, whatever. Why is it that Buddhist monks that live in a monastery that do absolutely nothing with their existence as it pertains to westernized ideology have the highest instances of happiness? Why? They have nothing. They all wear the same clothes. They all get the same haircut. They meditate for however many hours a day. I don't know what their specific routine is. They eat very bland food, if at all. They do a lot of fasting and a lot of bits and pieces. And they have... No fucking Risha Mills, no Lambos, no mansions, no nothing. No social media. Is no that? social media. Why are they so fucking happy? Because they realize that this is the way that it is. It's all internal. And their process is to remove what they call karma. And karma is just the actions of your doing. Whether you believe in past lives and reincarnations and stuff, you carry it forwards and whatever. But their doing is to go internal and find out, why do I think like this? Why do I have a natural tendency and inclination to go this way? Why does this happen? Why does this happen? You just mull over it. Most people believe that that's being distracted. Well, it's not because you're actually internalizing all those things. You're asking yourself questions and you actually get into this rhythm where you sort of have a communication stream with yourself. And everybody looks at the homeless guy on the street talking to himself as a bit of a weirdo. Like, yeah, okay, fair enough. But when you start to do it on a on a energetic base level and you start to question the things that you are more tentative towards or your tendencies are, are towards, you start to realize the futility of it all because the only one upholding it is you because you're the one that decides what you think and what you feel. And it's all internal. It's all an internal race. And you're like, okay, a practical example. Nerves affect you as much as you allow them to. And everybody always asks me, how do you deal with the pressure of competition? Well, I realize that pressure and nerves are an intrinsic thing. It doesn't matter where I am. It doesn't matter what I'm going to do. It doesn't matter how many people are watching or how many people are at the competition or anything like that. I, I, still, I still feel nervous. I don't let it own me because I realize that there's a certain amount of it that is attached to me wanting to do well. A certain amount of it attached to me knowing how much time I've placed in and, and how important it is but that it has nothing to do with anyone else and that you can't make me feel nervous because I refuse to make myself feel nervous. There's a small intrinsic amount that's going to be there no matter what. When you're driving a car real fast, you're like, oh, shit, I'm nervous. Um, but it's all an internal route. It's all an internal game. And if you can figure out that pattern and figure out the way that that works, you're no longer owned by your environment. So why would you whinge? Why would you complain? Why would you worry? Why, why are you worrying in for something that hasn't happened? Why worry in advance? Because then you get interest on it too. And then nine times out of 10, this is another practical example. Nine times out of 10, if you're anxious for some outcome and uh, you're just worrying about it endlessly, day in, day out, big presentation at work, going to ask this girl out, whatever it is, could be anything. Nine, ten, nine times out of 10, it happens better than you could have imagined. And all that anxiety was for nothing. And you sit there like an idiot. You go, why was I so worried? And then no one ever questions it further than that. They go, oh, you know, I was worried, but it paid off anyway, so don't worry about it. And they'll repeat the process next time. Correct, because they assume that the external thing was the thing that denied their worrying. It wasn't. It wasn't at all. Now, I want to take it back to, you spoke about, you mentioned Rhonda Byrne and, and kind of her, you know, the way she obviously describes the law of attraction by the secret, I think it's a really good introduction to that for someone who's never really looked into it. Maybe slightly more advanced is going, leaning more to the Joe Dispenza side where it's more into the quantum physics and, and that whole realm of things. Where is your understanding of this based more closely to, to Rhonda Burns or more closely to Joe Dispenza's belief in the way he explains the, the law of the universe and energetics and how that all works? 
I like the dispensers backing it with a lot of science, but I don't think you necessarily need that. That's just for the confirmation for all the geeks. Yeah. They just need to know the the intricacies of the way that it works. And I've done a lot of go dispenser meditations. I've done the walking one. I've done the lying one. I've spent – used to have this hellacious morning routine where I used to do that, and then I used to do like sitting in the sun, and I used to do the cold showers and all that sort of stuff, and I've never been less Sunning productive. Sunning your asshole, whatever they call it. Sunning your balls. <laughs> I, Sunning I've, your balls, I've yeah. never been less productive in my entire life because by the time I finished that big fucking morning routine, I was exhausted. Yeah. Like I need a nap. And uh, I, I like the way that Joe – uh, explains it and, and what, what he's doing is not special. It's not unique. It's not the first of its kind. It's just that he's patterning it in a way that allows you uh, specifically more materialistic thinkers to go, oh, well, if it's backed by science, well, then I can believe it. Mm. And it's just that element of that belief factor that you're talking about. And really everybody, everybody says that I like to coin it in a way as useful delusions. If you're usefully deluded in believing that you can do something, even when you have no evidence physically of it, you persist in that, you'll get it. Yeah. If you just persist and it's amidst, and you're asking for it. You're literally asking for it. You're asking for chaos. You're asking for drawbacks. You're asking for negatives. You're asking for failures. You're asking for negative people to come into your life. You're literally asking that because it's nothing is for free. Anything, everything has an equal and opposite reaction. So if you're asking for this big payoff, what you're also asking for is how does it, how does the universe accept that? it's going to be worth it for you. How is it an equal and fair exchange? Most people see high level business owners, eight, nine figures, and they go, oh, that would be lovely. All my problems would be solved. And you're like, hey, listen, motherfucker, you don't know how much stress I deal with on a day-to-day basis in terms of operations, in terms of dealing with customers and everything else. Yes, I do have the the big business and it's nice, but it is an equal and opposite exchange for the things that I was willing to do. I have more because I was willing to become more. That's it. Now, you've spoken about and you kind of alluded to just a little bit earlier in this conversation about the limitation of our five senses and how a lot of people, if we can't see it, touch it, smell it, taste it, whatever, it doesn't exist. Talk to me about your beliefs around that and how limited thinking it is to believe only what you can, like I said, see, feel, touch, taste, and smell is all that exists around us. If I can sing my favorite song in my head, am I really listening to it? If there's no music playing, am I really listening to it? To you, I guess you are, yeah. Exactly. If I can smell my favorite focaccia bread and have my senses and my mouth, my, my saliva, think about biting into a lemon. This is the easiest one. You immediately salivate every single time just by thought. Mm-hmm. Is it real? No. Yes, it is. Oh, well, it's not really happening, but the sensation that you feel is 100% It's not real, real as it pertains to the third dimensional realm, mm-hmm. but that – isn't real anyway, because this table is 99% space. Just atoms vibrating around a fuckload very quickly. And that just, we're limited by our own sense perception. And I really like the whole, uh, the whole Alan Watts viewpoint on this is that just, you have to, you have to figure out a way to see like the duality and then the, the middle, the middle piece of it all. And he's like, well, okay, well, a black and white different. The opposites, right? Well, they're opposites extrinsically, but intrinsically, they're both colors. Okay. Is left and right different? To a lot, yeah. In our understanding, I would say extrinsically, yeah. yes. Yeah. Intrinsically, they're directions. Mm-hmm. There's always a middle way to be found. So if mind for some people and physicality for some people are separated, what are they unified by? If I can't touch it, taste it, hear it, feel it, but I can imagine that I can, what unifies those two things, mind and body, Mm -hmm. experience? So if they're unified by that underneath the covers, just so that it was difficult to try and find it out, because if you found it out out of the gate, if you start the video game with all the cheat codes on, immediately boring. You learned all the skills at the beginning, it's fucking boring. Why would I even try? I won it all. Why would I bother? So this is like the cosmic hide and seek of the game. Like you've got to you've got to see it on the on the surface as being opposite, but not really recognizing until later on, until you really start to puzzle solve that it's actually the same. That's that's the really interesting part to me. Like if I look, hold my hand out, how do I know that that's my hand? How do I, I know, know I have? How do I know I have five fingers? 
Because there's a space in between your fingers. Because so there's an environment it. between the fingers. Mm -hmm. Does that mean the environment is separate? Because if I take the environment away, where do my five fingers go? Together. They go with it. And if I take my five fingers away, where does the environment go? It goes with it because now I can't fucking delineate between what's what. If I take your background away or you take the background away from me, where do I go? If there's, no, back, see there's no background behind me, you can't see me. Yeah. So they are inseparable. Meaning that your experiences, whether they are here or here, are also inseparable. So what you create here legitimately fucking exists. So in this physical world that we're living, this 3D world, what is what is this to you? Is it a game? Is it a what, what people have, what do they call it, the fucking simulation theory? What is it in your belief from all your research and experience and study and just practice of being a human being and living on this planet? What are, what are we doing here? What are we all doing? It's just a continuation of what we are creating. And we're all complicit in it. That's it. So the whole I am that I am thing, that's all this is. Like the only reason I'm here today is because I think I have shit worth saying. And the only reason you're here today is because you've done all the things that you needed to do and created those things exactly the same. Mm -hmm. And collectively, we have a collective creation, 99% of people who are, actually it's probably an unfair statistic, uh, some majority of people are complicit in creating the crises that we're all hearing about all the fucking time because all they do is tune into the news and think how horrible the world is. They also whinge and bitch and complain. And they also are uh, subjugated underneath a terrible world. So where do they live? In a state of fear. Well, that's where they live. Yeah. They live in a terrible world versus people who are Buddhist monks, monasteries. They think the world is a wonderful place because they can create anything they want. So that, that begets like the energetics. And as soon as you start to see the, the futility of this, you start to really get the piece of the puzzle because you're like, oh, I'm the, I'm the one that's responsible for the way that I see it. Therefore, it is created as I see it. So then you don't worry about whinging or complaining or bitching or anything else because you're the one who designed it. And if you're the one who's designed it, you finally realize that, you finally click onto it, then why don't I design something I really want to experience? And then you do that and you go, oh, this is sick. I wanted to ask you a question. It's a, it's a quote and I know it's not from you, but it's you speaking about something in one of the – like 500 plus books that you've read, where, where is it? Um, so things are separated by distance and time, communicate irrespective of the distance and time. That's, I love all this shit, and, but it is for people that don't, haven't been as well researched. It's a bit of a mind fuck for lack of a better word. Explain that to me or people listening in, in layman's terms. So things are separated by distance and time can communicate irrespective of the distance and time because it ties into what we're all mm. talking about, right? Or everybody does it on a on a daily basis now that we have these little black mirror devices on us all the time. Exactly. We'll talk about things you can't see. I Who? can't can't see that, but I can pick up my phone and call you any time of the day or night. Any part of the world. Yeah. The time machine, essentially. That's what it is. And we use it every day. We don't even think about it. Mental, man. Yeah. And then that's it, right? And so that's alluding to uh, quantum physics and to say that something can communicate – uh, non-locally to something all the way over. So an atom that is uh, hinged upon here could be on the halfway other side of the universe and it could experience the same thing because it's been linked. And this is the same phenomenon when you think about somebody, 20 minutes later they ring you. Same is exact. Is that quantum entanglement? Is that connected to that? What's ex We have explained it. It's you creating that. Okay. They're getting a mental notification that you're thinking of them and they think about you as a result of that. And everybody's experienced Everyone's that. Everyone's experienced so that. They, that's what I'm going to say. So they it's can't universal. say it's bullshit. Yeah. They can't. You can't say it's bullshit. You might not be able to explain it, but it's certainly not bullshit. There have been multiple moments in my life where I've, I've had experiences of that and I've even done a lot of psychedelics that so should come to fucking no surprise to anybody. Uh, I was able to speak to my dead great-grandfather and he told me to stop taking my life so seriously. And I finished that. I woke up the next morning. I rang my nan, who is married to uh, that guy's son, my great granddad's son, or my granddad. And I said, I need to speak to you guys about something. I had a really weird dream last night. I didn't want to explain mushrooms to him. <laughs> I said, They're old. They're in a boomer phase. And I went over there and I said, He goes, Oh, you've been talking to, uh, you've been talking to my dad. I'm like, Yeah, yeah. He said, Stop taking your life so seriously. And he fucking spat out what he was drinking. 
And he looked at me, he goes, hey, I don't know how to tell you this, but when he came back from World War II, he's a bit of a bit of a, like a grizzled vet kind of guy. And he uh, didn't really deal with the PTSD all that well and was really shell-shocked and kind of just burrowed in, in a farm in Richmond for a little bit and didn't speak to anybody. He was real angry, real pissed off guy and real fucking pain in the ass to be around. And no one blamed him for it. It's, you know, you serve the country, you did what he needed to do. And my granddad went up there and he said, uh, he's like, oh, how are you doing? And he chewed him out for it. He goes, dad, you know what? You need to stop taking your life so fucking seriously. And that was the last conversation he ever had with his dad. Seven days later, he died. That was the last words that may have been spoken to him altogether. And I ate some fucking shrubs from the ground. He came back to, to give me that piece of advice. And I was going down a path where I was taking things too seriously. I was thinking, oh, this guy said this because that means that and then blah, 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 and internalizing it and everything like that. And I'm like, fuck, there's, there's no way that that's – there's no way that that's accidental. I cannot be I cannot be disproven in my thought that that's accidental. Twelve months later, after religiously applying that advice, I go again, and the first thing that I hear is, "I'm proud of you. You did it." First thing, and if you've ever done these things, you'll you'll notice that there's like a color and a light show for about five hours. The weirdest experience. I've done it a lot of times. Five hours, lights, everything, kind of like a kaleidoscope. Once I heard those words, all the visuals went. I just started. I'm like, what the fuck's going on? And it was almost like a knock to say, you're done. That's it. You're good to go. And talk about that. Did I? Well, I did. I chose to be born from the daughter of the dad of that guy only so that he could come back and say that to me because if he said that to anybody else well maybe they didn't have the ears to listen to it so just like we non-locally communicate across distant space and time with people we think about them and they ring us and they go oh well, what a coincidence it happens when you really think about it without distant space and time so like yeah he's gone from here, I'm not gone. And I've had multiple experiences in my life like this. I had a, a situation where I was at Jamboree, the big slides, eight or nine years old. And whenever I used to go to my nan's house, uh, who was my grandmother's mother on the other side of the family, she had these like beautiful flower beds in her backyard. It's actually the uh, the granny flat at the back of my grandparents' house. And you could smell it. You go, oh, that's Nana Blue. You'd all, you could always smell it. Oh, sorry, Little Nan. Nan, I believe was the other one. Little Nan. You could smell Little Nan all the time. She'd come and hug you. You just smell flowers all the time. And she passed away about three weeks earlier. Where I jammed I was going down this slide. I'm only eight. Chubby little fat kid with no muscle mass. Eight years old. I fall up and over the edge of the slide. It was like a 10-meter drop. And I'm hanging by my fucking fingers as an eight-year-old. And I'm like, oh, well, this is it. I'm going to die. I didn't internally say that, but it looked pretty grim. I smell these fucking flowers from my nan's backyard and immediately, weightlessly, I am lifted inside the slide. And I just flip back in and slide down. I never told anyone for like 15, 16 years. Didn't remember it. And then it's so visceral that I can smell the flowers when I tell that story. Psilocybin and, you know, mushrooms and any, any sort of hallucinogenic like that. But let's talk about mushrooms. Like people – take that and they will say all sorts of things and, and, and they have these profound life-changing experiences. They feel connected to source. They feel like they are source, all these things. How in your understanding as well, and I like to ask you these questions because you're a very well-researched man. How does a chemical compound that grows in legit cow poo mm. be able to someone to eat it? And then an hour later, they are having all these realizations. And I know the people like the scientists that are against this will say, it's all coming from within themselves. It's things, you know, traumas and thoughts they're already having within themselves. But a lot of people like yourself are having these experiences that are clearly coming from the external. Not, mm. It's not all happening within. How does, do you have any sorts of thoughts or theory on how this chemical compound can, can do that and deliver 
that to us living in this physical 3D world, to have these connections, experiences, and see things that prior we could not see, we could not understand, we could not hear. The scientists are right. It is all internal. None of it's external. They're not showing me things I do not know. I knew that intrinsically. Forgot, I knew that I was taking my life too to seriously. Access that. Yeah, exactly. And it's the same dilution process I was talking about before. If you're bombarded energetically with anger and hate and distrust and all that sort of stuff, well, then you'll never see the clear picture. You'll always be misguided by your judgment. But it's your responsibility for that. And what, what it allows you to do is dilute the physical reality and remember that it's all bullshit and none of it's real mm -hmm. in terms of it making you who you are or it making you feel who you are. You make you feel who you are. You decide who you are. Every single day you decide who you are. And even in a practical example, if I wake up every single morning and I decide, am I a big fat fuck and I'm like 50 kilos overweight? I wake up every day, I decide to eat 200 more calories every single day than I need. Five years down the track, I am who I am. Do it in the opposite faction. 200 less calories than I need every single day. Every single day I make a decision to eat 200 calories less. Is it magic? No. I'm deciding who I am. I'm starting to associate that with my identity and then copy that across to my actions, which means that identity is what you make it and what you decide that it is because it's fluid. And I'm not talking about fucking gender fluidity, whatever. Leave that. Put a pin in that. It's a whole other conversation. Not interested. But I am interested in the fact that people decide who they are based on their external circumstances and based on things that have happened to them. But it's a choice. I choose to see what's happened for me as a beneficial thing, not what has happened to me as a negative thing. So I can decide exactly who I'm going to operate as only based on my choices. And then my actions will follow. And then that's it. That's your identity. And you can completely reshape yourself in six months, 12 months, five years. And the sheer fact that you can do that means that it's all intrinsic. It's a very physical, real world example. You're not fat because your fucking parents are fat. Yes, you will have some metabolic dysfunction as a result of them being there. But if I put you in an environment with five of me in a house where all you did was my schedule, you will look like me in less than five years. You will think like me. You will talk like me. You will act like me. Less than five years. Why? Well, everyone knows you're the you're the you know um. What's this like? You're, you're the sum you're, of the, the, sum of the five around. people. But also, as well in in this world, I think it's it's not just physical people. It's the podcast you listen to. It's the words you say. It's who you follow on social media. That too. It's all that starts to bleed into your reality. Yes, but you start making an intrinsic decision to go, I can do that. Because you just see it. You see it all the time. But it's like a subconscious thing and people don't even realize it because that's why they can so easily get led into the negative, right? Yeah, but they choose that. If, if your life sucks. Yeah, I understand how you, yeah. Yeah. You say they choose that. I feel like some people may be choosing it. They know spiritually, but they don't know quite consciously that they're doing these things. Oh, no, I, I was there. Yeah, yeah. I was there. That's why I have authority to speak about this. Yeah. Because I am not who I was five years ago. Mm. No. Well, this, we're talking about monks and spirituality and connection. We look at how they live their life and how they are so so much closer to the understanding of the true purpose and the true way the world works and the true being. Like our the way that we live now with technology, with the fast pace of everything, with all the like news and all this stuff, it isn't conducive to understanding self and having that spiritual connection to us and everything around us. So how do people navigate that? How have you been able to step outside of that, still be ambitious, work hard, have all these goals, have nice watches, fancy cars, travel the world, but still at the core, not let that, you know, consumerism or that, you know, like I want to just achieve and be great and fill my potential. How have you been able to pair that with a really deep connection to self and to the universe and to what's going around us? Because not a lot of people can do both at the same time. Like you said, some people will be hippies and monks and go all in that direction. And some people will drive Ferraris and McLarens and be depressed, you know, in their $120 million mansion at, at the end of the day. 
how do people start to, you know, bring both of those worlds, really key parts to being not only successful, but happy and fulfilled while they do it. How do people start bringing both of these worlds into their reality? Like, like the journey you've gone on. It's a choice again. You, you can choose to be one way. And so I don't define those people who are without nuance, like on the end of the spectrum, you were talking about hippies that are completely spiritual and everything like that. And uh, these guys are 120 million mansions, probably depressed to drive Ferraris, whatever. I don't define that as success because my experience, at least those people are acting in opposition to something. Those hyper successful millionaire people are driven by crazy insecurities. And I have them. I have some of them. I've worked very hard to dilute a lot of them. But at the beginning, uh, one of the main driving forces that I can really sit back and think about my story is that I got into a lot of fights when I was at school and I didn't feel very comfortable. And then I got glassed in a house invasion when I was 18. I didn't feel very comfortable about that. And now, what a fucking surprise. I dive so hard ape in to a combat sport in possibly reaction to that mm -hmm. as like a rubber band snapping. I could quite easily theorize that and think about that. But I'm now in a place mentally where I don't do that as a compensatory methodology because I've gone through those things. I allow that to be true, but I allow it to not also not be the reason that I do it. Those people, the ones you were speaking about, they're doing it because they had nothing when they grew up and that's allowing them uh, Patrick Bet David has a beautiful book called uh, Choose Your Enemies Wisely. And he goes, you have to upgrade your enemies because the one that fulfilled you to get to here will not fulfill you to get to the next one. And people that start businesses because they hate being poor will drive them into the ground mm. because they fucking hate one element of what they used to be. Well, how have you processed that? Because it's something a lot of people go through and they make some money. How have you continued if anything your 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 motivation to succeed seems higher now than it was before how have you not let you know you like you said you didn't grow up money was always an issue now that you have money and a, you know a roof over your head and that isn't something over your head that you have to stress out about and you can actually buy nice things and have a nice car and travel the world and buy you know nice watches how have you been able to achieve that and then still found further motivation is it essentially the principle he's talking about here you've had to level up your enemies the, the driving factor in in your life now It's more of a representation of myself and the energetics of which I'm starting to attract things. So it's not that I am reaching for these things. It's that these things are a very good indicator and a match of the energy that I've been able to cultivate as a result of dealing with all the past things and all the other bits and pieces and really being ruthless with the dilution of things that waste energy. Uh, nice cars, nice watches, nice houses, uh, money in general. How do you buy those things? You use money. Money is energy within a system. If you are producing energy within a system, you will be rewarded with energy in a system. A business and its base fundamentals is that you are delivering a service to somebody that they are exchanging what their energy for what they cannot produce energetically on their own. They cannot make the thing that you make on their own. You have done it for them. Therefore, they give you energy for the energy that you put in on this back end. So uh, everybody has these fucking weird things on billionaires and like they're fucking dodgy people and they suck and whatever else. Or even a, a better example, why do soccer players earn hundreds of millions of dollars a year and doctors earn hundreds of thousands of dollars per year? Well, everything like, and that's the thing people speak about capitalism and, and why like something that comes up a lot as well is like, I just think it's, it's an exchange of what people want to give their energy and time for. Right. Like yeah. a lot of people will be upset. And this is a whole other thing, which won't go in, go into like, why do women athletes not get paid as much as men athletes? Well, if they had, you know, the viewership that men did, then they should be paid more. Yeah. It's the same sort of principle. It's, it's a value discrepancy, mm -hmm. a top level surgeon, neurosurgeon can only operate once or twice a day because of how intensive the work is. So their capacity to impact X number of people will be limited by their, their time. And it's not broadcast or anything like that. 
So they will eventually impact hundreds of thousands of people. So they're compensated with hundreds of thousands of energy. Soccer players are in the limelight. They're broadcast. They are uh, deified. Everybody loves them and they're motivational things. They will impact hundreds of millions of people. So they are compensated with hundreds of millions of energy. Whether you like it or not, whether you like the guy, Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, all those guys have impacted billions of people. Billions of people know who they are. If billions of people knew about me, I'd be much wealthier. <laughs> if billions of people know what you guys did yeah. here, you guys would never worry about money ever again. You'd have unlimited capital. So when you start to think about it like that, you go, okay, it's, in, it's, it's energy in a system. And a really good mate of mine who is wildly successful explained this to me and it finally clicked. And he's like, wow, okay. So it's not something you chase, you give first. And it's a reciprocal nature of what you deliver. And Rick Rubin has an awesome quote about this. He goes, I don't even play a fucking instrument. He's a musical genius. And he goes, I make music for me first. I give to me first. And then I give it to everybody else. And then they compensate me with how I was generous to myself. Because it's all intrinsic. It's all a mental game. And that's it. So interesting, man. Um we could, we could stay on this topic all day. I want to ask one other thing before we start wrapping this up about a couple of things, actually. Your belief in that we have had past lives and you will be reincarnated in a different form. Where did that come from? Have you ever read the book, uh, The Instruction by Ainsley McLeod? No. It's really interesting. It's about that. Like you should I think from the research I've done on you, you'd really, you'd really enjoy it. Really easy read about like how each level in life, like we have these different levels and like you're at level one, it's all about all these things. And as you get up to level 10 and then each level, there's like many lives that you have in each level until you get the core message and what you are meant to learn about that. Then you can move forward to the next. Mm. I think you'd really enjoy that. But where did this belief or this understanding about reincarnation, the soul and energy doesn't die with the physical body? Well, I think that it's kind of, easy to assume that energy is neither created nor destroyed because it's a physical law. Um, even if you burn this piece of table, it'll be put into energetics in terms of like the steam and the kinetic energy from the fire and everything like that. So this redistributed back into the system. A really easy example is the, the water cycle where it gets evaporated from the sun, rains goes up down. into the clouds, rains back down. It never really is created nor destroyed. It's just it's it there, right? Yeah. It just changes form. So I think it's, I think it's ridiculous to assume that we wouldn't do that in some capacity and that every time you hit the reset button, you don't get to keep everything that you got in the previous one because that would be cheating. There's no looking behind the covers. And that the whole, the whole goal is continual development and transmutation. So I, I go back into a lot of the, the alchemical texts and that's a fascinating topic if anyone wants to get into it. And alchemy is basically like the philosopher's stone and turning base metals into gold, but it's not. It's a metaphor. It's, it's turning thoughts into things. It's creating things. And how do you transmute the lead that you've been given in your entire life and all the shitty experiences and all the crap and all the doubts and all the fears and all the anguish and put that into a method where you could churn out on the other side, joy, elation, happiness, love, enrapturement, all those awesome things. Or how do you transform a really shitty start at life and then transmute that into a valuable experience for everybody else that would listen to your story, that would gain something from it? And that's kind of how I see why I'm here. Like I've done a deep dive into numerology and um, life path numbers and all that sort of stuff. And you don't, you don't need these things, but they are cool guiding mechanisms. And if you'd read mine as a, a life path eight uh, before this conversation and you listen to this conversation, you go, it's fucking spot on. Mm -hmm. you're, you're born to essentially be a leader. Uh, you're born to um, attract a, like a high level of achievement, uh, material things uh, in the wake, and they, they weren't for a very long time. Um, but it's, it's a lot of the key qualities that I've like surrounded my entire existence with now and it comes as no mistake. Um, but it, it took belief in me to, to read that and then confirm that because I'd kind of already known. Numerology is super interesting. And if you haven't, if you're listening and you haven't looked into that, do it because it, it like does give you a lot of answers to mm -hmm. things that you may have already been thinking or feeling. Are you familiar with the work of Dr. Robert Edward Grant? Mm -hmm. Fuck. 
again. That guy's a genius. Genius. I've never heard him stutter, stammer, or say um once, and he talks about the most complex, ridiculous material. He, like, I, I sometimes think that I'm a little bit smart when I listen to people like him, and I'm like, I'm a fucking monkey with a rock. <laughs> yeah. I don't know, man. What, are you high IQ? You seem it to me, but also like you. Probably you just, not. I don't know. I mean, I fucking break people's joints for a living. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe. You ne- you, have you got like, I know you've got a website and like, you need to put together a reading list just for people if they want to, because the fucking, uh, the mass of information that you've accumulated in so many different interesting fields, fields and then how they stack upon each other to create someone that can, like you said, create anything they want. It's really fucking interesting and fascinating, but mm. Yeah, Robert Edward Grant and his work's crazy. No, and something I know you're aware of, and this is stuff, some of the stuff that he breaks down the mathematics of like the universe and the Great Pyramid of Gaza, how it mm. exactly lines up to the size of Earth and the axis, all these things that I'm too stupid to explain the yeah. way he does. I know you're, you're, you're a lot better than me. It doesn't just blow your mind when you realize that. And, and what, like, give, give me one of those things, because I can't remember them off the top of my head about how the pyramids line up to whatever. And then, Trust me, go do some research on this yeah. and just think about it and then think about everything we've been taught about the universe and how things were and who built the pyramids and how long they've been there and all these things. And just question, don't do anything with it. Just start that process of questioning. And I think maybe in five years, if you open yourself up, you might see the world in a different way. Yeah. I think it's the, the latitude that it's laid on is the exact same number to nine decimal places of the speed of light. Yeah. And if you multiply the base width by 4,200, which is as many seconds in a day, then you get the speed of sound or something like that. And there's all these uh, mathematical phenomena like pi, uh, the golden ratio, Euler's number, all of these things are directly intrinsically linked to this. And then he's starting to do some research now in terms of the, uh, the musicality of it and in terms of the energetics and the frequency and the fact that if it has a specific slope angle of 54.1 degrees, then you will be having this sort of note. And then you can match that and geolocate that around the globe to be able to cross pollinate uh, what they were trying to teach us. And then he's figured out that it has seven chambers on the inside to match directly the seven chakras. It's also um, astrologically lined up directly underneath the three Kings to one, one millionth of a degree. Uh, And then the pursuit, the technical precision is just completely ridiculous, but all that to say there aren't any fucking accidents. Mm-hmm. So stop telling yourself that there are accidents. Oh, well, I, I accidentally dropped a car. I used to tell this to personal training clients all the time. And I said, uh, is it an accident that you dropped a cup? And they're like, what do you mean? Like, do you say it was an accident? They go, yeah. I was like, stop it. Because you weren't holding it properly. And it's not to blame yourself. It's to go, okay, well, if I don't want to drop cups, I'll hold them properly. Yeah. I don't drop cups. I don't remember the last time I fucking dropped a cup. Or if I trip, I trip because I wasn't watching where I was going. It wasn't an accident. If you have a car crash, things led up kinetically that enabled that crash to happen. It wasn't a fucking accident. Stop thinking that they exist because they don't. Let me ask you this. What's one thing, and I was asked this question when I did a Q&A podcast a few weeks back. What's the biggest thing or one thing that pops to mind that you've changed your mind about over the last, say, two or three years? And a lot has changed in the last two or three years, but what's one realization you've had that, yeah. The whole energy in the system, money, that was a big one. That uh, the genuine, that genuine religion's bullshit. And I say genuine very specifically because the monotheistic Abrahamic religions are all fucking bullshit. Uh, but that God was like this man on a cloud type of thing. And throughout my reading in, in the theosophy of um, or like the Gnostics and all these ancient, ancient faiths and the alchemical stuff is that they start to believe that Christ was a metaphor for how you live your existence. Don't cheat, don't lie, don't steal, don't murder, don't be a fucking dickhead. Feed people in need, like feed the homeless, help people out. Be a good guy. The golden rule, as far as I'm aware, as far as I'm concerned, is that if you love your neighbor as yourself, everything's sweet. Yeah. If you treat people the way that you would like to be treated, then that will all be reciprocated to you. I had a belief probably about two or three years ago that it was all just if you do the work, it'll happen. And yes, absolutely that is true, but 
if you start to your your business will explode. When I say this very very seriously, when you start to think about the customer journey as if you were buying from your own business. Your conversations will explode when you start to listen to people as if you would like to be listened to. Your relationships will explode when you think about how you would like to be treated and then you treat that person that way. You follow your word, you show up on time, you uh, surprise them with little little bits and pieces. You think, oh, well, I would really like to be taken out to dinner, so you take them. And there's this reciprocal nature with the universe is exactly what you put out is what you get back. And I, I take that very, very genuinely. And I think that's remodeled a lot of my psychology for the last two or three years because I used to think just, oh, it's just numbers and ones and zeros and all that sort of stuff. And when you think about it like that, you get massively outsized returns because nobody's ever going to be able to go, that guy didn't give a fuck. You're not. It's not true. And I will be able to sleep at night knowing when I lay my head down on the pillow that I'm not – grafting people or fucking people over or cheating or stealing or lying or anything like that, sleep peacefully. So even if I do get the result that I'm after or I don't get the result that I'm after, I can die knowing that I did what I needed to do and I did what I said. And if I can get to a stage where I do that and I legitimately leave nothing in the tank, I'm good. Wherever I end up is wherever I end up. And I've said this before, I don't know if jiu-jitsu is going to be the next three years or the next 30. Don't know. Excited to find out. Do you put do you define your purpose very clearly, or is your purpose just to explore and become the best version of yourself? This one's a tough one because you go back to the numerology stuff and you can think, okay, well, this is why I'm here, but you just ultimately decide that anyway. But um yeah, it's it's to it's to give a fuckload more than I took and leave nothing, nothing on the table. Like really wring the towel dry of this existence. Because what the fuck else are we going to do? Well, I want to be known as the guy who took from everybody and just hoarded all these materials. Fuck that. I, w- I want to be remembered as the person who, who really gave it a fucking crack. Like I, I love this Hunter S. Thompson quote and I always paraphrase it wrong, but he goes, why are people so concerned with arriving so nicely and neatly across the finish line in a pristine box in pristine condition? He goes, I want to go over the line with an emphatic bang, massive wow, all used up and worn out, bruises and everything, going, wow, what a ride. That's what I want to leave. I don't want to do the safe thing. I don't want to do the expected thing. I don't want to do what people thought of me. Who give less of a fuck? Like I've lost friends for that too, a lot. And that was a small price to pay to realize they weren't legitimate friends, which is great because I was going to do what I was going to do anyway. And I was going to arrive thoroughly used up and worn out. People say this to me all the time. They're like, oh, you don't stretch. You'll have fun rolling when you're 50. And I'm like, I fucking will, cunt. Because even if I do end up used out, man, it's going to be a sick ride. And you're trying to like put that over me as if that would be a a, a negative? Nah, I earned those knee injuries. Yeah, They're fucking sick. And every time I look down at the scars on my leg, I'm like, yeah, that's when I submitted old mate for a fucking world title. Sick. Look, bro, we could, we could, I could chat to you for easily another two hours. Um, maybe we'll do a part two one day, but we'll, we'll wrap it up. It's been almost, it's been almost two hours. Like we've covered so many different topics. If someone wants to get in touch or just follow you and see everything you're doing, where's the best place they can find what you're putting out? Uh, HPU coaching on all platforms. Uh, I don't actually, I, I lied. I don't do Facebook. I don't do Twitter or whatever the fuck that is. So um, TikTok, Instagram, YouTube, YouTube channel is a lot about this sort of stuff. Yeah. Uh, Mindset King on Spotify, which we're now yeah. publishing on YouTube. Yeah. Um, yeah. If you if you if you want to find me, it's pretty easy. And what's like what's got what does the next twelve months have entailed? Are you going back over to to the US to compete? Yeah, in August. In August will be the world title. So I already qualified and won that in November uh, in Singapore. So I'm going back for my second dance, and uh, we'll see what it awaits. Maybe a new belt. We'll see. Yeah. Yeah, could break be. Some, break some more fucking records, could turn be. some more heads. Could be. This is not the reason I do things. It's all very nice. Yeah. Um, but yeah, as long as I'm giving it my best crack and I can 
lay down and say that I'm pretty fucking happy. So I love it, bro. We'll leave it there. Um, honestly, if anyone has any questions about this shit, like just go and research and dive into all these topics. But I've, I've started my journey on this in the last couple of years. You've gone much, much deeper than me. I need to get some book recommendations for you or something, but just start exploring these topics and the way you see the world and the way you live your life will be completely different. So we'll leave it there, brother. Thank you so much. Appreciate Pleasure. it. Cheers. All right, guys, thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed this episode or you got something out of it, do yourself a favor, do me a favor, do your friends a favor and share this with them and they can come along on this journey with us. Thanks again and I'll see you next time.